Hi, everyone. I think I'm going to get started here. Um, I'm Adelina Iktene. I'm a law professor here at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you for our first event in our inaugural uh, Criminal Justice Speaker Series here at, um, at uh, Dalhousie. Um, the series is, uh, has been created by the law school together with the Criminal Justice Coalition at Schulich, which is, um, which is new. And it brings together um, faculty, students, alumni, and community interested in criminal justice uh, in the broad sense, criminal justice as social justice. Um, so we have an absolutely phenomenal um, event to uh, kick off our series with, and a very timely one. Um, I would like to, uh, to, to send a big shout out to the uh, Criminal Law Students Association, particularly uh, Ellie Sutton and Maggie McCain that have worked very hard on the series. So I'm very, very proud to be working with them on this. Um, and I'm talking to you today from Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded Mi'kmaq territory. And um, I would also like to extend an invitation for you to consider um, and to think of uh, the territories that uh, you are all watching from and uh, the people that have inhabited these territories from immemorial times. Um, it is particularly important, I think, to do so as we're talking about a very, very important issue today. Um, and that has to do with, um, with how criminal justice system, a very a purely, you know, very strongly colonial, uh, colonial um, institution uh, is engaging with and impacting uh, indigenous people, not only here in Mi'kmaq, but across Canada. Um, we have two amazing speakers today. We are very pleased to be hosting Professor Kent Roach from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Um, and uh, my wonderful colleague, our own Professor Naomi Metallic. Um, Professor uh, Roach is going to be talking about his book, Canadian Justice, Indigenous Injustice, um, for the first part of the event today. And that will be followed by Professor Metallic's remarks on the presentation and on the issues brought up. There will be a bit of a conversation between Professor Metallic and Professor Roach, and we will save the last 10 minutes for your questions. So I'm going to invite you to use the uh, Q&A option that's at the bottom of the screen to uh, submit any questions you may have during the event at the end um, of the talks. And I uh, will come back in the last 10 minutes of the event and fill the question and put them to the speakers. Um, so before I uh, switch my camera off uh, and let the event begin, I will introduce Professor Metallic and then Professor Metallic will introduce Professor Roach. Um, so Naomi, uh, Metallic is a law professor here at the Schulich School of Law, and uh, she is from the Listuguchi Mi'kmaq First Nation uh, in um, Gespagegwagi. Was that correct? Okay. Um, she is also the Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy. And she was a law clerk to the Honorable Michelle Bastarash of the Supreme Court of Canada between 2006 and 2007. Naomi has been named um, to the best lawyer in Canada list in Aboriginal law in 2015 and was chosen for Canadian Lawyers Magazine 2018 top 25 most influential lawyers in the area of human rights advocacy and criminal law. As a legal scholar, she is most interested in writing about how the law can be harnessed to promote the well being and self determination of Indigenous peoples in Canada. So it is my great pleasure to now uh, let Naomi take over and I will see you at uh, the end of the event. Well, Alan, thank you, uh, Adelina. Um, I'm very happy to be with you this evening and introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Kent Roach. Uh, he holds a chair in law and policy at the University of Toronto. He was appointed a member uh, of uh, the Order of Canada in 2015 for his advocacy as a scholar and litigator for human rights. He presented um, Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto in a variety of cases, including Gladu, and will be uh, presenting, uh, representing the Asper Centre in Shulan, defending the constitutionality of the abolition of peremptory challenges uh, in response to the Stanley uh, Colton Bushi case. 
Uh, Canadian Justice, Indigenous Injustice is his 14th book and was shortlisted for the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. He is currently working on a book on Canadian policing. Um, and I had the pleasure of getting to know and work with Kent as part of an expert panel a couple of years ago who wrote on policing in Indigenous communities. Uh, and I'm honored to be involved in conversation with him this evening. Take it away, Kent. Well, thank you very much, Naomi. That was a very generous introduction. So I, I plan just to speak for about 20 minutes. So there's lots of time, both for Naomi and uh, for all, all, all of you. I'm very grateful for those of you who have joined us. Uh, I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the Mississauga of the Credit, and I'm very grateful as a settler uh, to be on these, these, these lands. Um, my, uh, my book really starts off, and this is something that I learned from Indigenous colleagues who wrote about this case, really starts off with history and uh, what happened in the Gerald Stanley Colton Bushy case happened on Treaty 6 uh, land. And in many ways, uh, what happened that day uh, and the subsequent events I think were a violation of the spirit of Treaty 6. Now, two of the people that were involved in the negotiation of Treaty, the, Treaty 6, you see on the screen, Alexander Morris, I know he looks a little bit like Sir John A. Macdonald. Uh, he articled for Sir John A. Macdonald, um, um, but it is not Sir John A. Uh, and uh, the person uh, on my right is, uh, and, uh, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Miss Tamaskawa, uh, better known as Big Bear. And uh, in 1876, uh, Big Bear refused to sign Treaty 6. And one of the reasons he refused to, uh, to uh, sign Treaty 6 is that when he asked Morris, uh, will there be a noose around our neck, Morris, in a way of kind of white settler uh, defensive lawyers, said, well, if, you know, of course, there will be a noose around your neck if you kill someone illegally, uh, but I also promise you that there will be a noose around the neck of someone who kills uh, uh, one of you illegally. Uh, so that's not what Morris, uh, that, 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 that's not likely what Big Bear meant. It was likely a mistranslation uh, of the Cree, uh, but Morris did make a promise uh, of the equal rule of law and a promise that we will see uh, is uh, quite strained uh, both in history and, uh, and uh, in the Stanley Bushy case. Um, the next is uh, a grave marker uh, for eight um, Indigenous men uh, who were hanged uh, uh, at Battleford, where the Stanley Bushy case took place in 1885 in the uh, follow-up to the 1885 uh, uprising. Um, again, in the book, I talk about how um, the settlers uh, in uh, Fort Battleford assumed that the indigenous people would attack them, even though uh, many of the indigenous people took the treaty seriously and did not join with Louis Riel and the other May, 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 Métis in the uprising. These eight men uh, were uh, hanged uh, publicly, even though that was illegal in Battleford in 1885. They were tried before an all-white jury. They were tried really without any defense counsel and without translation uh, from, uh, from the, 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 the Cree. Uh, some might be tempted to say, well, that's ancient history. Um, and how is that relevant to the um, uh, Stanley Bushy case? Uh, but as as, as this uh, poster demonstrates, it is still uh, very much uh, relevant. Um, so in, 
in the book, in chapter three, I go through a series of cases that I was not aware of before I started researching the book, where uh, cases from Saskatchewan involving all white juries um, and, and um, uh, uh, acquittals. Uh, the Alan Thomas case you may be familiar with, it went to the Supreme Court of Canada on a coroner's inquest in, uh, in uh, 1965 um, and uh, looks very much like jury nullification of white men who killed a Cree man. Uh, the other cases uh, I mentioned the Donald Marshall case, although it's not uh, from Saskatchewan, but obviously from Nova Scotia. Donald Marshall wrongfully convicted uh, by an all-white jury and the Helen Betty Osborne case where peremptory challenges were used in Manitoba to ensure an all-white jury. Uh, one of the things, and I was very fortunate to have John Burroughs share with me some of the work that he had done in Saskatchewan with uh, treaty elders, um, uh, um, uh, about the only sort of upbeat um, uh, note in the book is uh, really an argument that uh, we have to go back uh, to the treaty uh, in order to find any sort of common ground. And this is also something that I hope to work on uh, uh, with respect to policing. Um, there, there, there was a uh, argument in Saskatchewan in 2014 that the peace and good order clause in Treaty 6 and Treaty 4 required a jury of six Indigenous people and six non-Indigenous people. And I go into the history, even in colonial Canadian law, of mixed juries, both mixed juries that included six citizens and non-citizens in cases involving non-citizens and six Anglophones and six Francophones in cases before there was simultaneous translation. Uh, so even within the colonial system, the mixed jury, which in some ways I think uh, replicates some of the aspirations of treaty uh, um, uh, of, of treaties, uh, especially when it's considered that the jury requires unanimous consent to bring a verdict. Uh, but that was rejected uh, by the Saskatchewan uh, Queen's bench in 2014. And you know, I, I just leave with you as a thought experiment of what would have happened had there been six Indigenous people and six non-Indigenous people on the Stanley jury. Uh, in fact, uh, despite the underrepresentation of individual Indigenous people on juries for various reasons, including that many Indigenous people do not want to serve on juries, which in some ways I think is quite understandable. Uh, we almost had a six and six jury, if you imagine uh, what would have happened if the peremptory challenges were not, uh, uh, um, not uh, available. Moving to the jury selection, uh, uh, with respect to the Stanley case, uh, 750 people were summoned uh, to Battleford uh, in January um, 2018 to serve on the jury. Only 178 showed up. So there likely was an underrepresentation of Indigenous people right there. Uh, Saskatchewan uses health cards, uh, but um, the judicial district of Battleford extends all the way to the border with the Northwest Territories. Piecing together from press reports, um, uh, which of course are not you know, completely accurate, but it seems to me that at least 20 of the 178 uh, were uh, uh, in Indigenous people. Uh, there, there were 12 who were excused for hardship reasons, as of course many people are, are excused from jury duty for hardship. Three people uh, were excused because they were re related to the Bushy Baptiste family. Uh, and of course, there were five who were subject to peremptory challenges by Mr. Stanley. Um, so um, moving on, um, there was no challenge to the fact that although Indigenous people constitute about 30% of the adults 
in the battle for district that there were likely not 30% of the 178 were indigenous. And I think that if there had been a challenge to the 178 people there, the fairness of the array, unfortunately, it would have failed under the Cacopinus decision, uh, which uh, to my mind, uh, and I did represent one of the interveners at the Court of Appeals, so it may be sour grapes on my part, uh, but really rejects uh, ideas of sub substantive equality, which have been mainstream in really any, all other parts of uh, Canadian law uh, since the 1980s. Even more shocking, uh, there was no questions asked of the jurors in Stanley case about whether they would have racist bias uh, towards an Indigenous victim uh, or, uh, or if they had been influenced by pretrial publicity. And I, I, in my research, I was very surprised to find that the prosecutor in the Stanley case had actually convinced a court in an earlier case stemming from the Saskatoon Starlight Tours where a police officer was, uh, was charged uh, and the victim uh, uh, was Indigenous to ask the, the Williams Parks question, which basically is, are, are, are you such a racist that you will not be able to decide the case on the basis of the evidence that you hear? Um, I'm going to get into a little later, and I'm happy to take questions about whether that's an adequate um, uh, 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 question. Uh, even though I was involved with Williams, um, that was a long time ago. I'm very old. Um, and um, uh, I don't think that it is an adequate question. But the fact that it wasn't uh, asked is really quite shocking. And it is quite shocking in light of this Facebook post, uh, which in 2016, after Mr. Stanley's arrest, the picture is of Mr. Stanley uh, uh, going in uh, uh, for a bail hearing. Uh, Brad Wall, then the premier of Saskatchewan, uh, uh, posted on Facebook that there had been racist and hate-filled comments on social media, and these must stop. Uh, it's a betrayal of the very values and characters of Saskatchewan, and they are uh, dangerous. And, you know, given this sort of pretrial publicity, it really is astounding that um, uh, no questions were asked of the jurors uh, uh, before they were in, in, in panel. And then, of course, as you know, uh, when uh, five visibly Indigenous people came forward to serve as jurors, they were subject to a peremptory challenge by Mr. Stanley and his lawyers, meaning that uh, uh, they simply said challenge, and that was accepted without any reason being given. Uh, one of the things that I found rooting around in social media is how much there was social media polarization uh, about the case. And this reflects GoFundMe uh, sort of uh, uh, pages. And, 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 and again, this raises a question of how, uh, uh, how jury selection needs to change in an era where, uh, you know, no longer does pretrial publicity come from the local newspaper with the possibility of a change of venue as a way of getting away from that publicity, but now is spread through social media, uh, often inaccurate, hateful, racist, and polarized ways. So, I mean, for example, why were people not asked if it, or, 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 or a request was not made to the trial judge to ask people whether they had contributed uh, to either of these funds. Um, it may be that they could still be impartial, but it would seem to me that this is something uh, that is uh, very, very rele relevant. 
So moving on uh, beyond um, uh, jury selection, um, you may recall uh, that uh, Mr. Stanley's defense was actually not uh, a formal self-defense. Uh, it was rather that, um, that it was a hang fire or an accidental discharge of the old pistol uh, that he obtained uh, from his shed. And this crime scene photo is, I think, quite um, important in understanding uh, uh, that hang fire defense. And as I wrote about this, I really drew on, uh, on my teaching and writings and those of others, um, um, including Emma Cunliffe uh, from the University of British Columbia uh, on, uh, on wrongful convictions and the issue of science. So let me just take a moment to explain. Mr. Stanley's testimony, and I had access uh, uh, through the generosity of David Tanovich and the University of Windsor Faculty of Law to the full transcripts of the preliminary inquiry and, and the trial transcript. Mr. Stanley's testimony was that he fired uh, 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 two warning shots uh, when he was approximately here uh, at the far uh, um, uh, Ford Explo Explorer. The two um, indigenous people who had exited the vehicle and were running away uh, testified that they were not warning shots, they were actually shots at them. Uh, Mr. Stanley then testified that he ran uh, from that vehicle first to the front of this vehicle and looked under this vehicle to see if it had run over his wife because his wife was on a riding mower somewhere uh, 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 to my left of the picture. His testimony was then that he came back and that he reached in with his left hand to turn off the ignition while his right hand uh, with the pistol in it uh, was behind Colton Bushy's head. And that at that point, uh, the pistol uh, accidentally discharged. He also testified that he did not have his hand on the trigger after firing the warning shots. Uh, his son's testimony uh, was uh, substantially similar, although his son said he walked, okay? Now, the reason that I'm kind of belaboring this point is that um, um, it became apparent at the preliminary hearing that the hang fire defense was probably going to be Mr. Stanley's main defense. And this person was a, an RCMP expert, a forensic expert, and uh, in between the prelim and the trial, he did some research on the available evidence, scientific evidence about recorded hang time. And unfortunately, as is the case with much forensic science, um, there's not a lot of research, but the research that he found, and I was able to kind of duplicate it because there's so little research out there, is he found two articles, uh, one actually written in the NRA's magazine, so um, that was unusual uh, reading for me, uh, but both of these confirmed that in experimentally induced hang fires, uh, the delay between pulling the trigger and the bullet exiting amounts to no more than half of a second. Now, um, he brought those um, articles uh, to the trial. Uh, I think he would have been prepared to adopt them in, uh, uh, as his evidence, uh, but he was never asked to do that. And, but he did testify on the basis of that, that this was the observed uh, 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 scientific evidence about hang fire. If you accept that and you go back to this, um, I think the hang fire defense uh, becomes um, much more difficult to believe. But at the other time, uh, what was entered into evidence by the accused 
and was an exhibit. So it was actually something that the jury took back uh, uh, or had available to them during their deliberation was a hunting manual. And the hunting safety manual said, if, if, if you pull the trigger and nothing happens, keep the gun in a safe position for 30 to 60 seconds. Now, if you think a hang fire could, could occur 30 to 60 seconds after pulling the trigger, perhaps, perhaps you would have a reasonable doubt about this. But of course, the, the, the hunting manual had absolutely no scientific basis. It was a precautionary principle. It could have said, uh, keep the gun in a safe position for 60 to 90 seconds or for 60 seconds to 120 seconds. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, the jury was uh, not left uh, with a precise enough argument on this issue. And of course the jury acquitted Mr. Stanley of both murder and manslaughter. And the manslaughter was done on, or the theory of the manslaughter was through a careless use of a firearm. And usually um, having a gun at the back of a person's head is careless use of a firearm. But the judge said, if you have a lawful excuse. And um, so although the judge never instructed the jury about self-defense, he kind of left unlawful or lawful excuse completely undefined to the jury. So did the jury think that the lawful excuse was 30 to 60 seconds? Maybe. Did the jury think the lawful excuse was self-defense? Uh, I would submit that it's not reasonable self-defense, but the jury was never told about self-defense, nor the reason that it had to be, or nor the legal requirement that it had to be reasonable. Uh, so obviously this is guessing at what the jury uh, thought. It's a crime in Canada for the jury to disclose what they thought. Uh, still remains a crime under the criminal code. Uh, but this was part of my uh, attempt to dissect uh, the Stanley trial after. Now, the other thing that enters into this is I make an argument in the book that although the self-defense was never formally pled, and although the jury was never instructed about self-defense, there was a phantom self-defense hanging in the air. And here, the social context is extremely important. There were a lot of concerns about rural crime. There's a lot of racial polarization in Saskatchewan about uh, the issue of rural, rural crime. There were concerns that um, I think three RCMP detachments had to be called uh, before someone came. There's also the expanded self-defense laws, uh, which came uh, not uh, uh, from a rural uh, uh, crime and self-defense area, but from this case uh, from Toronto, where uh, the Harper government expanded the laws against uh, 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 self da, da, da fence. And uh, in the trial, trial transcript, uh, Mr. Stanley testifies as to his subjective fears about people using their vehicles to crash into crowds. And um, this, uh, what happened on the Stanley farm happened approximately a month after this happened in Nice, France. Uh, so, you know, again, Mr. Stanley may have been thinking about that, whether this is a reasonable analogy, I, I would suggest it isn't, uh, but um, he was allowed to testify about that. He was also allowed to testify that uh, as he was walking towards the car in which Colton Bushy died, uh, that he was thinking of a 1994 rural crime murder with a connection to the Red Pheasant First Nation, which is where Colton Bushy lived. Now again, how is a 1994 murder relevant to a reasonable perception 
of self-defense. Um, that was really never explained to the jury. I don't know whether the jury uh, put the dots together with the connection uh, to red, 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 red pheasant, but it seems to me that uh, given that uh, Mr. Stanley testified that he did not know that there was a gun in the car, that this raises an issue, an issue that we've seen in the United States of unreasonable and arguably racist self-defense. And that is, as with the Bernard Getz case in the New York subway, self-defense that is animated by racist fears and stereotypes. And similarly in the Trayvon Martin case. Just to conclude, um, I include a chapter in the book on how the indigenous witnesses were treated at trial. And again, this goes back to uh, the Donald Marshall Jr. case, which I've always included in my criminal law materials in over 30 years of teaching criminal law. And so much, I think, in both the Marshall case and in the Stanley case depended on issues of credibility. And of course, as people in Nova Scotia know well, those are very complex issues and really involves both the background of the trier of fact and also the need for diversity among the trier of fact. And so there was a lot of cross-examination of the Indigenous witnesses that was extremely hostile. The witness who uh, testified, uh, who, who was sitting in the back seat with Colton Bushy, uh, the one there were there were two Indigenous women in the back seat. One was too traumatized to uh, testify at trial. The second one said that she heard two shots, and the forensic evidence suggests that it is only one. So she was accused uh, 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 in an aggressive cross examination uh, of lying. Uh, and eventually the Crown prosecutor said that he would not rely upon her evidence. And again, I mean, I fortunately have never been in, in a back seat when someone has died beside me. Uh, but I don't, you know, you know uh, uh, the, the assumption that uh, the two shot uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, a malicious lie uh, seems to me at least uh, to be uh, questionable. Uh, another factor is that all of the Indigenous witnesses uh, were uh, arrested at the scene, as was Mr. Stanley, um, and they were charged uh, with various offenses that were later withdrawn, uh, and uh, discrepancies between their original statements to the police and subsequent statements at the prelim and at trial were used to impugn their credibility. Uh, when you read the transcript, um, there is no mention or no allusion to the Indigenous presence in, in the courtroom except on two occasions. And uh, press accounts suggest that this was a racially polarized court with indigenous people on one side and uh, white settlers on the other. Uh, but the two references were, were uh, to this eagle feather uh, 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 that was brought into the courtroom uh, by Colton Bushy's uh, uncle. And the second reference uh, was just before Gerald Stanley was subject to the Crown's cross-examination, arguably the most critical element uh, of the case. And the trial judge uh, instructed um, um, uh, uh, um, this, uh, this man not, that he had been asked by the jury not to have the eagle feather uh, waved. Uh, so that's something that at least gave me pause. Now, of course, the acquittal, uh, murder and manslaughter uh, was as polarized as, uh, or, uh, as the lead up to the trial. Um, 
uh, although 30% of people in Canada in an Angus Reid poll uh, thought it was a good and fair uh, uh, verdict, 63% in Saskatchewan thought that, although 32% uh, in Canada thought it was flawed and wrong, 17% in Saskatchewan thought it was flawed and wrong. And although there is not a, um, uh, a breakout uh, 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 as to who these people were, 17% uh, uh, of people in Saskatchewan are Indigenous. Now there was a subsequent case that many saw as the Stanley II case. It happened very close to where I live uh, near Six Nations. Uh, and uh, Peter Kill, uh, the man on my left, uh, was uh, acquitted both of murder and manslaughter for killing John Stiers, uh, who uh, was attempting to steal his truck. Uh, a new trial has been ordered by the Ontario Court of Appeal, but the Supreme Court of Canada has um, has uh, a granted leave. And so this will eventually be heard in the Supreme Court and may be the really the first test of the Conservatives uh, 2013 uh, self-defense law. Uh, one of the issues is uh, uh, the Court of Appeal in Ontario found that the trial judge erred by not instructing the jury to consider Mr. Kill's um, 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 uh, actions, which were to grab uh, uh, a gun, uh, not to call 911 uh, to approach Mr. Stiers in the middle of the night. And then when he thought he saw a weapon uh, to fire two shots. Uh, another issue may be uh, 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 whether uh, Mr. Kill's military experience is relevant. Who is the reasonable person? That's an issue that uh, the law students in here uh, uh, listening to me will uh, grapple with, especially in, uh, in uh, first year. Uh, but the last issue is um, it, uh, whether we can actually do better. And Bill C-75 uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, 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 included an abolition of peremptory challenges of jurors. Uh, and the Supreme Court uh, will hear uh, a case dealing with its constitutionality and whether it applies uh, retroactively or prospectively, uh, I believe on October the 7th. Um, I support the abolition of peremptory challenges uh, because I believe that it is impossible and that the American experience demonstrates that it is impossible to control their discriminatory use. Uh, but I do have to say that I don't see this as a panacea. Um, I testified before the Parliamentary Committee on Bill C-75 and outlined a whole other host of jury reform uh, um, uh, 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 proposals, uh, all of which were rejected, uh, but uh, I have a new article in the Canadian Bar Review that discusses that. But at the end, um, I'm left uh, with uh, the, the understanding that the jury is really a, a symptom. Um, it tells us that something is fundamentally wrong with the colonial Canadian criminal justice system. And I think that we need to look to broader justice policing uh, and other uh, 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 treaty-based reforms. So I've spoken too long, uh, and so I'll hand it over to Naomi. Thank you so much, Kent. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Um, and in fact, uh, I am going to ask you some questions about law, but you know, your talking brought me back to the day that I heard about the acquittal and how I felt and I kind of felt like I was um, punched in the stomach and I, I, I wrote an article about that in the conversation and, and I, you know, I, I think I spoke on behalf of many Indigenous lawyers who work in this system trying to make it better. Um, but, you know, have these moments where it all just, you know, you have these moments where you're like, why am I doing this? It just doesn't seem that this system is fair or cares. 
you know, and, the, and, and so, you know, the things that you were talking about, about the witnesses, and I also think about how the police treated the family and how they lost evidence that, about the car and, you know, the sort of the dehumanization that occurs uh, in, that, in that case. And then, you know, and then we, you know, in speaking for Indigenous lawyers, we sort of, you know, pick up the pieces and go on and keep fighting. But, you know, that's how we felt this summer as well with what happened with the police shootings in New Brunswick. And so it, um, it can be a challenge. So I'm, I'm not gonna stay on that emotional point, but uh, just to kind of acknowledge that, uh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I live in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, stuff happens. Um, I guess the other thing I, um, I wanted to say with that with respect to students to get the perspective of um, you know, the, the families, uh, there's a great movie by NFB called We Will Stand Up. And I recommend that and it, it gives a, um, you know, I think a really important perspective from, from the families as well. Um, okay, so getting back to, to law, um, I do want to ask you a little bit about the, the Shulan uh, appeal. Uh, we assign it to read for our students in, in our uh, mandatory Aboriginal Indigenous law course in first year. We also assign King, which is uh, also being appealed, I understand, but not being heard at the same time. And I have to say, I agree with Shulan. I am, I am with you on yeah. peremptory challenges, um, but um, I, I'm interested in your perspective of the court's decision in King and these types of arguments, because there was an Indigenous offender. And the way I read the court's decision, it almost seemed to be saying, the judge just saying, well, you know, peremptory challenges are, are you know, my, uh, minority groups, the last sort of bastion of hope because, you know, we, the, the judiciary, are not good enough. I, like, I kind of got the sense that he was saying, like, I'm not going to, nor can I really police racism in my court. So that's why we need peremptory challenges. And I'm just wondering what you think about that kind of analysis. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's a very perceptive reading of King. Uh, and, and look, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I think you have to get rid of peremptories, but I think a lot more else has to be done. And so one of the things that I'm hoping is that we don't rely on the one, are you a racist question. I just think that, you know, that may, may have made sense in 1993 and 1998, but given our understanding of implicit bias, we really have to have more of a conversation with prospective jurors. And so one of the things that I'm hoping is is that one of the other changes in Bill C-75 is now the judge has to make the decision whether the juror is impartial or not. And I'm hoping that the judge will recognize that he or she needs a lot more information. And hopefully we can get, get around this idea that we've really stressed traditionally that you know we're not the states and we don't want to invade the privacy of prospective jurors. So I think that that's, uh, that's, uh, that's one. But, you know, I, I mean, I have to say that, you know, uh, uh, it pains me that um, a lot of, uh, that racialized groups are on different sides of Shulan. Uh, and people that I, you know, respect, like Nader Hussain, uh, uh, are on the other side. And, you know, they're arguing that peremptory challenges are really the only thing that we can use in order to have a more representative jury. Um, and, you know, that may work in some cases, uh, and it may work in Toronto, uh, but I think that in many cases, it's not going to work. That if it's a battle of peremptory challenges, you're going to keep those who are in the numerical minority off the jury. And, you know, one of the things about the We Will Stand Up documentary is, you know, that, that there's one of the jurors that were, or prospective jurors who was subject to a peremptory challenge and they interview him. And, you know, here's this person that despite all this kind of colonial history is willing to do his part as part of the jury and yet you know they just kind of said you know we don't like the way you look we don't like the fact that you have your hair in braids and uh, go home exactly i i uh i could talk more about that in both this decisions but i would like to with the time recognizing we're going to have some time for questions move on to another topic that I wanted to chat with you about, which is one of our mutually shared love topics of, you know, accountability and policing. 
so let's uh, let's talk about that and uh, ser uh, several events this summer. I think everyone listening knows what I'm talking about. Deaths here, deaths in the U.S. Um, and leaving several uh, groups calling for greater uh, accountability. And um, I want to ask you, what do you think needs to happen in order for there to be effective police accountability? And we can talk about education and, you know, these sorts of things as well. But I'd be interested from your perspective, from a, a legal perspective, because the constitutionality and legal sort of dynamics of how policing works is super complex. A lot of people don't understand. And um, we've also seen, I saw it in New Brunswick, we saw it in Nova Scotia with Portapique. Uh, jurisdictional issues kind of get used as, as an excuse for inaction. So, well, we can't do anything. It's the other government's uh, ability to do so. So just wondering, what, what do you think uh, some of the things that need to happen in terms of the strength and accountability? Well, I mean, one of the things is I think that we really have to rethink whether we want the RCMP to do the contract policing that they do. I really think that you know, uh, we need more democratically accountable uh, police forces uh, and done in a kind of transparent way. And I think that if we did that and we took some of the money that is used for contract policing and put that into, you know, self-administered uh, 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 forces or forces that were more responsive to local, uh, uh, lo uh, local communities, uh, that that would be important. I mean, look, uh, you know, the rule of law, uh, the SIU, the, you know, the Bureau de Enquete investigation, that is kind of the absolute minimum, right? That, you know, and it goes back to self-defense. I mean, I also think one of the things we need is to amend self-defense laws to say self, you know, it's not reasonable self-defense if it's influenced by racist stereotypes. And I think that we can learn a lot from feminist approaches to law, law reform, which, you know, with no means no has actually named these myths and stereotypes and declared them to be errors of law uh, because I mean you know uh, again I you know and, and then finally I think we really need to rethink use of force policies because it seems to me that we've gone on a kind of mechanical sort of thing where everything leads to force, right? So I, you know, I tried the taser, I tried the mace, and the next step is, uh, you know, three, four shots, center mass. Um, and I just think that we have to have to rethink that. And I think the only way we're going to do that is if police forces are more locally uh, accountable. So more in a kind of democratic politics sort of sort of way. Now that's great. Um, I like that idea of the, you know, particularly the, the self-defense uh, that, you know, you have to have a reasonable reason to be acting in self-defense and a racist reason is not uh, an acceptable one. Um, Adelina, I'm seeing it's 10 to 6. Uh, of course, I could go on asking Ken questions all night, but I know that you wanted to leave some question, time for questions. Um, yes, thank you for that amazing presentation, Kent, and thank you for um, your intervention, Naomi. I think that uh, I could just uh, sit here and uh, listen to you. I actually didn't even look at the watch. I was just sitting here listening to the two of you talk. Um, so we do have one, we have a couple of questions that are coming up now. And um, I, I think that if that's okay with you, maybe we can go a couple of minutes over and allow for um, uh, you know, for both of you to answer the questions. Um, so I encourage everybody in the audience, if you if you have questions, just use the Q and A. Um, just a very quick uh, question here from somebody is asking if uh, can't you have any information about uh, uh, who was the first Indigenous person who sat on a jury in Canada and when? Uh, whew. I actually don't, although. I think I've seen something recently. I, I don't think it was from Naomi, uh, but someone knows that, but it's not me, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I just, I don't know, Naomi, do you have a different answer? Not off the top of my head, sorry. <laughs> uh, the last question asks, uh, and I think that could be from for both of you. Do you think the sentencing should uh, be taken into account the indigenous background of an offender, Inuit, First Nation, Metis, or is that more harmful? So, I mean, I think that goes into um, uh, 
blood dew a bit. I'm not sure, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I do think that it should be considered, but I also think, and you know, this this may go back to Naomi's question about what accountability is for the police, is it seems to me that, you know, um, although I've tried to, you know, smooth out some of the rough edges at various times during my career, I have to say, as it starts to wind down, I'm starting to have more and more doubts uh, about, uh, you know, the entire adversarial system. Uh, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we need to think about is a much more holistic way to deal uh, with issues of misconduct. And I say that also with respect to the police, um, because, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm now trying to write a book about the police is I think that, um, um, that the, the, the accountability including things like the mandatory four-year sentence if you're found guilty of manslaughter and the use of a firearm, almost kind of backfires because it'll, it gives people an excuse to avoid acceptance of responsibility. And it means that in many ways they don't have a safe place in order to accept responsibility. And what's more important, to undertake to make uh, changes in conduct so that it will not occur again. I mean, so some of my despair about accountability in the adversarial criminal justice system is how many mentally ill people who have access to knives, which we all have in our homes, how many of those people have died? And you know, I'm sure from the police officer's perspective, um, being uh, brought before a criminal court, being brought before a civil court, being brought before disciplinary proceedings. Some police officers, Robert Christmas from the Winnipeg Police Office, uh, police uh, agencies, written a book where he talks about quadruple jeopardy. So I see lots of, you know, colonial accountability mechanisms, but not a lot of accountability. Um, and so um, one of the things that I think we really need to think about is uh, when we're attempting to punish people uh, and impose hard treatment on, on, on them, we're, we're giving them incentives to say, I did nothing wrong and I don't have to change anything in the future. And it seems to me that those are, are very different questions. But I'd be very interested in what Naomi thinks about this. Um, so I, I won't take up too much. I mean, a lot has been written about Gladue. And I mean, if we just focus on the, on the, you know, the current system, there's, there's provinces where Gladue reports are not happening. Uh, there are concerns about how Gladue is occurring, where it is happening. And so there's sort of those inside the system. But I, perhaps Elizabeth's question is, you know, does it may, may be part of the answer, and I've heard other things uh, such as, you know, it, it's uh, having to collect all that evidence and put that in front of, uh, uh, in front of a justice uh, can also be um, very challenging and taxing, and then, then that's on the public record, so there's all kinds of glad you issues, but the one thing that comes to mind is that it's it's tinkering within the system. It, it's it's been looked at for 20, 30 years as almost a panacea, even though the court said it wasn't supposed to be a panacea. It hasn't been, but it's also focusing our attention away from talking about like indigenous justice systems, right? And so it's a distraction in some regards. I mean, I, I think it is. It's a it, it has played an important role in some respects. So I'm not completely throwing it out the window, but it is also I think distracting and has been distracting the conversation from. I'm actually talking about indigenous justice systems. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think that that's fair. I mean, one of the one of the the things about getting old is 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 you start to learn that you know things that you thought were great victories are maybe not great victories, and and certainly Aboriginal legal services experience was you know when Gladue came down. Uh, uh, we, we really couldn't believe what, what it said, but within a week or two, 
uh, we realized that it wasn't changing uh, what was happening to our clients. And, 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 and so as some of you know, uh, there have been efforts to set up Gladue court workers, Gladue courts, and, you know, um, ALS has played, I think, an important role, but, you know, and I, I don't speak for them, but I think that they would say uh, there are some some real real limits and 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 yeah so I, I mean I, I I do think you know both with Williams uh, which allowed the the one are you a racist card I mean I still remember with Victor Williams that there was an affidavit. And I later found out that he was a person who had FASD and he participated in a robbery in, uh, in uh, Victoria, uh, partly as people with FSAD are very, sometimes very suggestible and he was kind of brought along. Uh, but he had this affidavit that I really thought if I had the guts, I would just read the affidavit in my, you know, then 10 minutes as an intervener and sit down. And the affidavit was, uh, you know, my lawyers have explained to me that there's probably not going to be any Indians on the jury. Those, that was his words. I just hope there are no, no Indian haters. And, you know, to me, he captured in, in, in a way that Justice Yacobucci also does, but in a much longer report, the fact that the jury is really a symptom and the jury is a symptom of a dysfunctional colonial uh, relationship that is not working for either sides. And I think that's, that's why we need to think about going back to the treaty because, you know, with this idea of polarization, I think we have to grab upon whatever we can uh, as potential common ground to move forward together. But I, I, I agree with Naomi that uh, we can't let this distract uh, from the bigger issues. But at the same time, we can't let cases like Stanley Bushy go, go un, unanswered. The Saskatchewan government didn't even hold a public inquiry or a coroner's inquest. If it had a coroner's inquest, it could have had a jury of six indigenous people, uh, three indigenous people and three settlers. Uh, that's available under Saskatchewan law. Uh, so one of the reasons why I wrote the book and others, I mean, I would really recommend to you Harold Johnson's Peace and Good Order uh, book, which really uh, uh, responds to that gut kick feeling that Naomi so elo elo eloquently uh, responded. I was actually hoping that he would win the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize, but the, the former Chief Justice beat us both out. So she, she needs the money. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. I mean, somebody is asking, um, and but I think this ties in, and you partially answered that already when you talked about the jury as a symptom, really, of a much bigger problem. Somebody is asking how you suggest to circumvent the online pretrial bias forming that forms from online media, and that really cannot be avoided. And I think, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. I think it really ties in with what you were already saying, that it's, it's part of a more complex issue. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, we don't use the jury nearly as much as as many other countries. And I think in those cases where we're using the jury, we have to take the time and ask people uh, what they've participated in on on online. Right. Um, and one question also that ties in, we also have a couple of questions regarding the self-defense, and I do want to get to them. But before that, um, one question um, here asks, when you say go back to the treaty, what changes or alternative setups do you envision working better? And perhaps this would also be appropriate for both of you. Right. Well, I mean, the material that John Burroughs was generous enough to share with me really uh, um, uh, uh, thought of uh, the Peace and Good Order Clause as something that contemplates two justice systems and talks about responsibilities of both. And so it would be much more like um, um, uh, relationships uh, based upon extradition, if I had to take an analogy uh, from our law. Um, and so um, I think there's arguments that, um, you know, because both Stanley and Colton Bushy were treaty people. And I think that there are arguments that they may have both 
um, violated uh, their obligations under the treaty. Um, and, you know, maybe this, this really uh, speaks to uh, the importance of understanding uh, the, the, the treaties. Uh, I mean, there was no mention, obviously, of Treaty 6 uh, in the Stanley case, and I think that there should have been. Yeah, um, and so I think the, you know there, there's a couple of different situations. I think there are situations where you have both settler and indigenous conflict uh, that you know um, maybe you know a, a treaty can inform. Some of my colleagues say a trans systemic approach where you're considering both treaty obligations and Canadian obligations and trying to figure out you know how that how to balance them. I think another um, a part of this is also you know a lot of um, uh, you know, what, what we consider to be crimes happen within Indigenous communities and we have, they have the criminal code sort of imposed on them and for the longest time people have been saying that it's not the right solution and they're saying it outside of Indigenous communities as well. But, um, you know, Indigenous people are saying that, you know, their treaty relationship also recognizes their self-determination, that the fact of having nation-to-nation -nation, um, agreements recognizes them as nations that had the ability to self-determine. And so there's a, there's a great big self-determination uh, aspect to this uh, about, um, you know, Indigenous people addressing, you know, safety and security issues within their own communities. Um, and, you know, if we look to our neighbor to the south, which we often like to compare ourselves to saying that we're better than them, I mean, the tribes have had, uh, are, are far more self-determining there, and many of them uh, address their own, you know, criminal justice disputes. So it's not as if this is, you know, something completely impossible. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, some, just uh, briefly, Kent, I think, I know you're addressing, I've heard you addressing this elsewhere, but, um, I think also for our students, this might be particularly uh, important for you to answer. Somebody's asking um, if um, if it was such an extensive issue of systemic racism present in the jury process, why was this not appealed by the Crown? Well, um, I think the Crown uh, could have appealed, but the Crown can only appeal on an error of law. And because the Crown didn't ask uh, for questions to be asked of jurors because the Crown did not insist on the jury being instructed about self-defense. There wasn't the same uh, legal basis for uh, that appeal. So, you know, in, in, in the Kill John Steyer's case, the appeal is going all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, but that's only because of allegations or uh, uh, of errors of law in self-defense. The problem in Stanley is there really were a kind of bare bones sort of instructions to the jury uh, because the Crown uh, had been so passive at trial. So there wasn't a lot of kind of raw material. Now, an argument that I make in the book is maybe the Crown should be able to appeal a miscarriage of justice and particularly a miscarriage of justice that's related to equality rights. I mean, you know, one of the big conflicts in the Shulan case, which is gonna be heard uh, in, in a few days is Kind of an understanding about equality, right? And that uh, those who are supporting abolition, at least the interveners, which include lawyers representing Debbie Batiste, uh, who is Colton Bushy's mother, uh, are arguing that equality kind of applies uh, both ways. Uh, whereas the interveners and others uh, who are uh, opposing the abolition of peremptory challenges really sees it as a one one-way street where it's all about the rights of the accused and the accused has always had this right and therefore should always have this right to engage in, uh, in peremptory challenges. One of the reasons why I, I argue for an expanded crown right of appeal isn't because I'm particularly crown minded. Uh, um, a lot of my friends would tease me about why I wasn't teaching a course on wrongful acquittals as opposed to wrongful convictions. But I do think that when equality is breached, 
uh, the, and and that is the reason for a wrongful acquittal. That is that is a miscarriage of justice. So I, I have learned from my feminist colleagues that we have to bring Section 15 into the criminal law, even though decisions like cacophonous and many of the arguments that are being made for the accused now uh, really want to keep the criminal law as an equality free zone. Uh, just a quick add on that, the decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal recently in Sharma is at least, I think, uh, you know, heart, you know, gives us some hope perhaps of seeing Section 15 do some work in criminal law. Exactly. Okay, so we made it to the last two questions. Uh, I know we're over time, but I do want to ask you this. They both go to uh, the issue of self-defense. Uh, so before we conclude, I'm going to put this to you. Uh, one of them asks, um, what in particular do you think should be altered in the current legislation regarding individuals using guns for self-defense? Yeah, so I mean, I think we need greater clarity about um, uh, if a, if a person brings a gun to, uh, uh, you know, th that their first impulse is to bring a gun. I think that's what the Court of Appeal was trying to get at in Cahill, but I think we need to spell it out. So, uh, so I really do think that we need to spell it out. And the problem is, is that the Conservatives really flirted with this growing gun culture in parts of Canada. And I really think that we need to put some rules down about the use of guns. I also think though that we also have to say uh, that what is reasonable cannot be based on a racist stereotype about fear and propensity to violence. Excellent. Um, I don't know if Naomi, you want to add anything on that or no? Uh, and the last question, um, was it ever considered by either the defense or the prosecution that the double shot heard by the woman seated behind Mr. Bushy was the supposed hang fire itself, meaning that a delayed ignition sequence with the primer going off first and then the propellant? Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a good, good, good question. Uh, there's nothing in the transcript. So again, this goes to this issues of how we judge credibility. So uh, certainly what was put uh, to the witness on cross-examination was basically that she was lying. And at one point, the trial judge kind of, you know, said, you got to tone down the cross-examination. But that was never really put. Uh, either that or also just misre misremembering uh, because of trauma or the fact that the witness, when she made her initial statement to the police, had been charged with assault herself and that that might have entered into her thinking. None of that is present uh, on the transcript. I want to thank both of you so much for uh, for joining us today and for helping us uh, kick off uh, this series with a very, very important, probably one of the most important criminal justice issues that we have at the moment in Canada. Uh, and we have many, so, and we'll discuss many of them throughout the year, but I am very happy that um, you were both here uh, and able to even if it was just for an hour to, to start to open this conversation. And I strongly recommend Professor uh, Roach's book if you haven't read it already. We, um, the library has a few copies as well. It's Canadian Justice, Indigenous Injustice. Um, and the, the, this session has been recorded. It will be available um, on the YouTube channel of the law school. And as well, if you are interested in um, uh, the recordings or in the future events, we have an event at the end of the month on the last Tuesday of each month from now on. Um, I encourage you to follow the Criminal Justice Coalition at Shulik run by our amazing students, uh, both on Twitter and Instagram. So on Instagram it's criminal.justice.coalition uh, and on Twitter it's Shulik underscore cream J. Um, our next event is going to be on October 27 and is going to be um, on the issue of advocacy in the federal prison for women. Uh, Sarah Tessier is going to be uh, joining us talking about her experience as a, a former incarcerated woman 
who has advocated for uh, women, both um, in, in, uh, by, with a, uh, habeas corpus and other, other forms, both from the inside the prison and now outside. And she will be in conversation with Senator Kim Pate and uh, Emily Cole, who's the executive director of the IFRI Society. So hopefully you're gonna join us for that event. Again, thank you so much, Kent, and thank you so much, Naomi, for this very, very rich conversation. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Adelina, for organizing it. Yes, Great thank you. Time. Thank you so much, Adelina, for organizing it. Thank you, bye. 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 Go, go, go Blue Jays. <laughs>